Welcome back today, longtime friend of the show, but we haven't talked in a while. The Bulwark's Will Salatan. Will, welcome back to the news. Uh, thanks, Matt. I'm really excited to be here with you. Always great to talk with you. And I want to start by discussing uh, something a little silly, but I think also telling, and that is Donald Trump this week unveiled these $399 sneakers. He did it at a thing. I, th I think this is true. I don't think this is a joke. I believe it was called Sneaker Con, which I think may be a play on words. <laughs> I may put that in the thumbnail of this YouTube video. Um, I don't know. I have a bunch of weird thoughts and things to say, but let's just start with you, Will. What did you make of that? So, all right, confession. I am the world's most culturally illiterate, fashion illiterate person. So my entire experience of this, my colleague Joe Perticone wrote a whole newsletter about it. And so I'm reading this, like Joe's really into sneakers. He skateboards, he like, he understands like the sneaker market. This, I'm just sitting here like a suburban guy, like what is this, right? Like I don't, I, my, I mean, I'll go to like, you know, us just like models or something and get a pair of like shoes to play basketball or tennis in. And that's, that's all I know. So I'm reading this stuff about people spending 400 bucks. And I got to say, Matt, what I read in Joe's newsletter just confirmed my worst suburban guy stereotypes about the sneaker market, that this is a complete ripoff, that there's, these are cheaply made, they're garbage, and then they're marked up and you put a name on them. It's like in some... What you want is for some celebrity to get, you know, videoed or photoed in, in your shoes and suddenly they're worth like, three, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times as much. And in this case, it's Donald Trump, right? Who like puts his name. So Joe has a thing in the newsletter. Some guy paid $9,000 for this cheap pair of sneakers that Trump monogram, like they autographed. Like, I, I don't understand it. Can you explain and it I to me? I think he was Russian or something. Uh, we can look into that, but, um, well, I will say my, I have, uh, my 11 year old was really getting into Air Jordans in a way that I thought was kind of consumeristic and unhealthy. And I think we're starting to lead him away, but he was like, wanted to collect them. And there is a whole thing. And I will say for Trump, um, he, I, I think he gets that it's, it's, he is he is trying to become like a lifestyle brand. That is my theory as to why the right was so upset with Taylor Swift, because they don't see Joe Biden as competition in the culture and the lifestyle brand culture, but they do see Taylor Swift as competition. And I think they get that in a way that traditional political people do not. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated by the way that this integrates with the whole sort of Trump apparatus. Like, so I'm, it reminded me of the whole history of Trump, like Trump steaks and Trump yes. vodka and all that stuff. Like, it's just, this is a guy, I don't want to offend, look, there are people in real estate, they actually build things, they make things, right? But a lot of Trump is just slapping your name on something and marking it up. It's a classic sort of, it's a, I think you know this better than I do, Matt, these, these corners of capitalism that are not about actually producing anything. They're just about like empty profit. And so it's all the stuff about brand and fashion feels like that to me. What do you, what do you actually, it's not actually a better yeah. sneaker. But I, no, I think, isn't it like a $20 shoe that becomes a $399 shoe when you put the T <laughs> flag on it or right. something? Yeah. So and the, it, the steaks and I the vodka. Sorry, go ahead. The sneaker con, <laughs> you know, thing is kind of true. And look, here's the other thing about Trump. He's going around right now saying, I don't have time to go to Iowa. I don't have time to campaign because I'm in the courtroom all the time. They're trying to, you know, stop me. I'm like, what? Well, you do have time to go, you know, hawk these, <laughs> these shoes, spend an afternoon at sneaker con. Come on. <laughs> right. It, but it's, it's, there's something perfectly metaphoric about the fact that it's just the Trump name or the Trump, you know, paraphernalia that's put on the shoe. That's, it's, it's the emptiness of Trump. It's the, that it's, it's all about his name and his image and his brand and his ego. And there's not, I mean, this is, we, I, I'm, I'm like so tempted to go into like some uh, deeper thoughts here about like what the Republican party is doing by becoming the Trump. You're, you're just branding yourself around this guy. And, and there's a kind of moral and political evacuation that goes on when you just 
it's all about this guy and his brand and his name. And the sneaker, I feel like, is a really good metaphor for that. The, there's nothing to the sneaker. As, as Joe, Joe No No Sneakers says, like, there are really good shoes. There's, like, the material that goes into them. You know, Joe likes to skateboard. Like, there's for people who actually want to use the shoe. But for these collectors and these sycophants, these hangers-on who just, like, want to sniff Trump, there's nothing really there except his name and his image and his ego. The other thing, too, about it is that Trump, you can see, and I'm, I, don't, I don't know how well this works, but, you know, I remember hearing back when Trump first started running for president that when he was on The Apprentice, his number one demographic were actually African-American viewers who love Trump more than anybody else. Now, like, I'm a Gen Xer. I think you're a Gen Xer. Our ethos was very, um, well, think of, like, Kurt Cobain, you know, it was like anti-selling out, you know, and in Chuck Klosterman's book about the 90s, he says, like, we're the only generation that like the cardinal sin is selling out. But Trump was always more into like conspicuous consumption. And, um, you know, you think of like some of the hip hop videos on like yachts and stuff like this. So like, it is interesting that Trump is now at least culturally trying to like reposition himself. The shoes are meant to be cool and young. Um, I don't know if it works with, I'm, I'm guessing there's some demographic out there. Maybe it's young white guys, I, I you know, in, in rural areas who also listen to hip hop and love Trump. I don't know who it is, but like, clearly this is him trying to be cool, right? You can't imagine like Adidas Romney shoes or, you know, or like <laughs> introducing, introducing the Rubio, you know, it just, <laughs> it's not fathomable. Uh, right. And, and, but what's the goal, Matt? Is it, is the goal political at all, or is the goal simply financial? Is the goal simply to like expand the Trump market for selling things? I mean, this was always a question about Trump. Was he ever in politics for politics? Was he in it for money? I, I think it, I think the money explanation is too simplistic because I think Trump's in it for ego and politics is a route to ego. And actually that's one of the comforting things about Trump. He's not a traditional fascist. He's like, he actually needs love and attention. He wants people to admire him. He cares about ratings. He cares about votes. He actually cares about getting votes. He'll, he'll fake it, but he, it's important to him that the people love him and the, the apprentice yeah. was all part of that. So I wonder whether what I, I, I hear what you're saying about looking for the youth, but I wonder whether it's, the youth vote or just the youth money or the youth adoration and be the perception that you're cool and that you're adored. And, um, and it's not just by these like, you know, Walmart voters, but it's like people who are like legit, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But I think that, uh, you know, right now we've got the attention economy. We talk about people like Matt Gates and AOC trying to get the attention, the attention economy, Trump, you know, craves kind of like a worship and an adoration. And like, it's one thing for people to vote for you, but to like buy your sneakers with your logo on it, it's, that's a deeper form of, of celebrity worship, of, 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 of hero worship, I think. So right. anyway, maybe, maybe we've, yeah. maybe we've analyzed the shoes <laughs> as much, as much as we could. Let's, Let's turn to, um, we'll stay with Trump a little bit. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, I did not prep you for this, but um, Trump was on Fox with Laura Ingram. Uh, we're, tape, we're taping this uh, on a Wednesday, so this was Tuesday night. <clears throat> and Laura Ingram set up uh, some names of people in the audience, and it was Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, Christy Nome, Tulsi Gabbard, who got a good bit of applause in that room and Byron Donalds and Trump went along with Laura Ingram. She asked if, if these names were under consideration for the veep stakes for people that Trump would consider to be his running mate. Now, who knows? Trump did not inject any of these names. He just agreed that they were all on the quote short list. But what say you? Uh, who do you who do you think? Uh, would be the the running mate uh, that Trump may select because I think he is the, uh, you know, likely nominee, <laughs> presumptive right. nominee, um, and, and who on that list maybe is a joke. Uh, so let's see. We've got the people who are who ran DeSantis, 
um, Scott, who else was on that list? Uh, so it's Scott DeSantis Ramaswamy. Oh, yeah, Vivek. Okay. Yeah, then oh, you've man. got he... Noam, Gabbard, and Donald, who were not candidates. Right. Okay. So no no, no Gabbard. Uh, G- Gabbard's, everybody knows that she's un- kind of loose, unhinged. Um, even for Trump, she's, she's too out there, and nobody knows what she would do. Uh, Byron Donald's, e- that's, that's if Tim Scott, I mean, all these people are going to like try to fill some niche, like I'm the woman, I'm the non-white person. Uh, within non-white, there's do you need to be black or can you be Indian American? I mean, I think I mean, Trump definitely has a women problem if you look at polls. So there's a de- there's a clear incentive for him to pick a woman. Yeah, Christy so like Noem, Elise, Elise Stefanik not mentioned. I, I, the, that's what I was going to say. Right? I'm looking at Christy Nome. And uh, the other, of course, Trump has a weakness for what he thinks of as conventional pretty, and that's Christy Nome, right? She, she's got those eyes. She's left. So he's a sucker for that. He might go for it. Uh, he's just enough of a misogynist that he might think Elise Stefanik is not pretty enough. But Elise Stefanik is, I'm looking for a nice way to say this, Matt. She sends off this very clear vibe, and she's very clear. I will do for you what the other girls won't. That is, that is her message. She literally got her job by doing what Liz Cheney would not, right? Liz Cheney said, I'm sorry, there's this thing, the Constitution, I have to stand by that over you. And basically, Elise Stefanik raised her hand and said, I won't, I don't care about the Constitution. I'll be, you, want, you want me to call the people arrested on January 6th hostages? I'll call them that. There's, I don't think there's anything Elise Stefanik wouldn't do. She's literally, I think, the first member of Congress to endorse Trump. So from a loyalty standpoint, Elise Stefanik has it. I mean, she's sending that message. I will do whatever you want. And for a guy who, well, I don't know, we have the 22nd Amendment, right? He can't, he can't do again what he tried to do another sort of January 6th. But if he ever needs his vice president to do anything unconstitutional, he knows that he can count on Elise Stefanik. And I think that counts for a lot. I think that does. Uh, Vivek also, I think, uh, is is high on my list of people who would do anything for Trump. Um, Tim Scott, we can talk about him more. I have just wrote a piece on him, but I think Tim Scott, he gives off Matt a little bit too much of a Mike Pence vibe, mm-hmm. like a guy who is actually a Christian, actually believes in something higher than Donald Trump and might in a pinch do the right thing. And that's a problem for Trump. That's so a I'm problem. not sure he'd go Can't for have yeah. that. No. Cannot have that. What, what do you think looking at this list? I'm with you, man. I think I think it's Elise Stefanik. Um, I think she is minimally accept. If you go through like different categories of everything he needs, she's at least minimally acceptable. She checks every box. So I <laughs> I go Elise Stefanik. Um, but I also I, I you know I think Tim Scott has a chance. Uh, I think Noam has a chance. I don't think Ramaswamy. I don't think DeSantis. I don't think Gabbard. Uh, Donald's is interesting. Um, he is, do you know, and I don't think he has a shot at this, but my perception has been that African Americans in the Republican Party have traditionally gone out of their way to signal to the voters, I'm nice, I'm really happy, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dangerous at all. And Byron Donald's like, I'm not going to do that, man. Right. He doesn't, that, that guy doesn't smile. Right. Um, so he's bringing a different vibe than any other, at least modern African American candidate that I've seen. I don't right. think that gets him on the short list. But uh, just me, or have you picked up on that? I think no one wants to talk about this because it's race. Oh yeah. Well, I, I was going to say. So I just saw. I don't know if you've seen American Fiction. I've so not. The, the, okay. So American Fiction um, and this movie that just came out. Um, as far as I know, because I'm illiterate, so it just came out to me. Um, uh, Sonny and Bush was, has already seen it 20 times and written yeah, a, uh, a piece yeah. for the Bork. I, I freaking loved it. And par- part of why I loved it is this was like, I felt like this is instead of like the cliche version of diversity, which is we're going to check a box, here's our black person, or here's our Latino person, you know, in the cast or whatever. This was a movie about diversity within a group of people, within an ethnic group. So which in this case is black people. So if you're white watching this movie, what you're seeing is a diversity 
of black personalities, which I think is the long range cure for segregation, like the literal segregation of where people live. Like you get more experience of the diversity of other people. And one of the things that I like about what you're pointing out with Byron Donalds is, I think it's super healthy for white people who tend to live among other white people and not see a lot of non-white people to see the diversity of personalities and attitudes within you know, the Hispanic community or the black community or whatever. And so to see the, the Byron Donalds character next to the Tim Scott character and see, wow, wow, like they're really different. Like it's not yeah. like, you know, monolithic. Um, it, I think that's super healthy. And the Donalds personality is definitely like hardcore. Is he Freedom Caucus or is he, I can't remember, but he's, he's out there. I don't know, but yeah, he's, he's not, he's, he's not, you know, peddling any of the, um, I disagree with the party about this and that stuff. No, he's a, no. he's a true believer. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned you have a piece about Tim Scott, and, and I thought the premise was very fascinating. Um, why don't you, I'll let you tell it, and then I, then I can weigh in. But tell us about the column. It's an interesting take that you're not going to get anywhere else. Okay. Th so this is a piece that I just, we just posted in the Bulwark this morning. Uh, this is Wednesday. Um, the, uh, and it's, it was prompted by watching Tim Scott this weekend talking about the two-tiered system of justice. So when Tim Scott talks about a two-tiered system of justice, he's not talking about what, what a lot of you know, black progressives talk about, which is a two-tiered in terms of race, you know, the way policing is done, the way black people get pulled over in a situation where white people wouldn't get pulled over, that kind of thing. No, Tim Scott's version of two-tiered justice is that Donald Trump is being persecuted by the Biden Justice Department. Um, so it's all political and it's about Republicans. And it, it, so at the same time, that Tim Scott is saying this about Republicans. He's telling black people systemic racism does not exist. Now, there is, as you know, Matt, a very solid conservative critique of the idea of systemic racism. I mean, in the, the whole part of the debate about critical race theory is all arguments about racism should be tangible. They should be falsifiable. It shouldn't be, well, the system is rigged. You, give me an example. Tell me exactly how this person is being discriminated against. Who's being discriminated? Don't tell me the whole system is. So, but part of falsifiability, I'm, again, I'm going with the conservative critique of critical race theory and of systemic racism. Part of that critique is, again, that it has to be falsifiable. So when we talk about the criminal justice system being rigged, stacked against Republicans, that this is the Biden Justice Department persecuting Republicans, you ought to be able, if that's your argument about the justice system, you ought to be able to answer the Mike Pence question. And that is, if that's true, if they systematically persecute Republicans, why is it that the same Justice Department that has produced special counsel investigations that have indicted Donald Trump did not produce a special counsel investigation, did not prosecute Mike Pence, who also had classified documents at his home. And the obvious answer is that Mike Pence cooperated. Mike Pence was at least like Joe Biden, if not more so. Whoa, I've got these documents in my house? I didn't know. Sorry. Come and take them, FBI. And they did, right? He cooperated. Donald Trump, unlike Mike, Mike Pence. because Mike Pence poses no threat to the establishment and to the, <laughs> the globalists. Uh, and to the corporate uh, bullshittery. I don't right. know. I'm just, right. I'm just making it up as I go. It is, it is an amazing thing, Matt, about Donald Trump. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm hearkening back, again, with the race metaphor, I'm hearkening back to a, an old Richard Pryor um, bit where he used to talk about, like, I went to go visit the brothers, as he put them at the time, the, the other black men in prison. Like, I wanted to find out why, the, why, they were, why they were in jail. And then there's this pause, and Richard Pryor puts on his scared rabbit face, and he says because they belong there. And he talked about how he, he spoke to these guys and they were really scary and they had done terrible things. <laughs> People, the reason why Donald Trump keeps getting indicted and prosecuted is because he's a criminal. He's a, he did criminal things. And so like, it's not like the, you know, the system is out to get Donald Trump. He's actually, he actually did these things. And Mike no, Pence well, didn't. No, 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 no. He is, he is Navalny. He is Alexei Navalny. And uh, Joe Biden is, is going after him uh, and trying to silence him. And Biden would love it if Trump were to die in jail, just like <laughs> Navalny. That's what this oh is, Oh, my man. God. Can, can we, do you want to go there now? The, yes. The, the, the Navalny stuff. 
Okay. Do you, do you, do you want to go off on this first or? Let's go. Let's no, we can listen wherever you take us. Well, let's go. This, this, this is such classic Donald Trump. And there's going to be from now until the election, Donald Trump, fortunately, is incapable of hiding from the public who he is. And who he is, is, as we said with the sneakers, it's all about him. He doesn't believe in anything outside of himself. So here is, like, a, here is an autocracy, a violent autocracy that is in the middle of murdering, you know, thousands and thousands of people in Ukraine, where the dissidents get murdered, where Navalny gets poisoned. If that doesn't work. He comes back. We send him to a prison. We off him. We don't know how exactly he got killed at this point. Um, but so he's, Putin is literally a murderer. And we re recall back in, what, what, when was it that Trump did the interview with Bill O'Reilly? And he's, you know, O'Reilly says he's a killer. And Trump says, it's probably oh, we got 2016. 20, 2016. 2016. Yeah. And Trump says, we got a lot of killers. We got, what, you think our country's so innocent? So this is a pattern with Trump. We, the United, not we, sorry, not we, the United States, America is no better than Russia. He's been saying this for years, right? It's nominally America first, but his whole thing is to obliterate the moral differences between America and Russia. I mean, if you really believe in America, what you believe is what America stands for, what's different about America, the ideals, the constitution, democracy, freedom, the rule of law. Trump doesn't give, he doesn't care about any of that stuff, right? And so, so he's all about obliterating, he's saying, we're no better, he said it to O'Reilly, and now he's saying it again. I'm just like Navalny. The persecution and the murder of a dissident it's no different from me being prosecuted for all my crimes yeah except navalny's crime as far as i could tell was being an opposition leader <laughs> against putin trump's crimes are you know sexual uh you know, i don't even say alleged he was not you know he was found liable for right. sexual assault it's in a civil trial. And then there's the four indictments. Um, so it's a little different. It may not be a perfect analogy. <laughs> Trump may not be, Trump may not exactly be involved, but pretty close. Right, right. It, 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 it's like, come on, Matt, if you had, if you had, I think you would have predicted this right beforehand. So Trump didn't say anything about Navalny. Everybody else said, this is the murder of a dissident by a dictator. Everybody else, so Trump says nothing, and you're asking yourself, is he ever going to say anything about Navalny? If he does, what's he going to say? He, he had I not bet... mentioned, he did not mention Navalny's name, I think, ever until this right. week. Certainly, according to the Washington Post, he had not mentioned Navalny's name the whole four years that Trump was president. Right. So when, when I'm sorry, I'm looking at, was this, this is a Truth Social post. I don't know when he, oh, this is from Monday. So he did post this before he went on Laura Ingram. Quote, the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what is happening in our country. <laughs> in other words, what is happening to me? Right. What kind right. of what kind of, of of narcissistic psycho do you have to be to look at the death of a hero in another country and and the first thing that occurs to you is oh it's about me. <laughs> They're talking about me. It, it is totally amazing to me. He's um, so right. Uh, and what he so I'm looking at what he said too. I didn't see the the Ingram interview yet, but he says to her, "This is quoting from it." They ask him about the uh, the fraud judgment against him. So Trump got he's got docked like eighty million dollars in the Gene Carroll case, or this is another three hundred and fifty million at least in the um, fraud case. Again. These are trials that have nothing to do with America. They're all about Donald Trump either uh, molesting, uh, according to the judge, literally yeah. raping this woman, or and, and, they're and, about and, Trump. And four different jurisdictions. Uh, in some cases, it's local district attorneys. In some cases, it's the Department of Justice. I think they're all going to be jury trials. We have something called justice in this country. <sighs> uh, maybe not quite as good. I'm sure they have show trials in Russia. But I think it's a little different here, too. I'm sorry, Matt. Are you under the impression that juries are American? Because <laughs> my, I'm given to understand by Donald Trump and, and the people who support him that, um, that these juries are in left-wing jurisdictions, and therefore they're not really legitimate. Whatever the juries come up with is Fair. not. Yeah. 
There's so, always like, a catch. There's always right. a re- there's always something. Now, according to Trump, a jury in West Virginia would have been legit. That's where they were trying to move the D.C. case. Uh, I guess there is going to be a jury in Florida. Trust and... me, he doesn't want to do it in West Virginia if I get put on that jury. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep you out. We'll, we'll hide this podcast so he doesn't know what you think. Uh, that, it's too late for that. But I'm going to predict to you that if the Florida case does end up going to trial— and the reason why I'm saying I'm not sure it will is because with all the stuff about classified documents, I bet they can push that. The Trump lawyers can push that till after the election. All that stuff has to be cleared and vetted. And then if Trump gets elected, of course, he's going to wrap it up. He's just going to say, I'm the president. The Justice Department has to pull out of that case. But if it does go to trial and there is an adverse jury verdict against him, I bet you he's going to say, that wasn't really a Florida jury. That was a South Florida jury. Right. And it's going to be another liberal jurisdiction. It's not somehow it's not going to count to the America first people who don't actually believe in American juries. You do have to give them credit. I know someone's like, you don't you do not have to give Donald Trump credit. But I do. I, I give Trump and the right credit for deviously brilliant spin. I mean, the idea that Navalny would be anything like, you know, Trump has spent all these years praising Putin. Tucker Carlson is in Russia, you know, interviewing Putin and praising their supermarkets. By the way, you can go, there's an Aldi in West Virginia that has those, you, you put you put like a quarter in or something, and then you, you could take, you get it back when you bring the shopping cart back. Um, but, but never mind that. Um, to take that Naval- N- Navalny's death, which which is obviously an indictment on Trump, who just let me also mention this single handedly stopped America from funding Ukraine, who was attacked by Russia. The idea that that narrative that 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 Navalny's death could be like co opted and weaponized against Biden, and that. Trump is going to cast himself as the martyr, as the victim, right. is audacious and also deviously brilliant that they would even try that. Oh, yeah. Can I, I, I'm, let me throw in one of my pet gripes about, about that particular tactic of blaming Biden. So on an issue where I think you would agree with the Republican position, which is Afghanistan, the pullout from Afghanistan, a lot of people blaming Joe Biden. And the way it happened was a mess. OK, I'm not going to dispute that. Yeah, but I don't think we Donald- should have left anyway. I'm against not only do I think it was a bad I not only do I think that the withdrawal was a debacle, I think we should have sent more troops and <laughs> they could have been at Bagram Air Base. But, you know, I, we we at, when we withdrew we kind of had things under control finally there and we gave up the bay anyway you know where i am but, on this. yeah yeah but but let me talk about where trump is for a minute for trump to go out there and he and this is he does this in every speech in every rally he talks about the disastrous withdrawal from afghanistan and how biden pulled out and i was going to pull us out with strength and dignity if you read any reporting about what happened in Afghanistan. Donald Trump was trying to pull out every freaking troop from Afghanistan before he left office. He didn't want to leave anyone there. He wanted to complete that mission of getting America out. And he didn't care what happened. He was, you know, that was his isolationism pushing through. And like Mark Esper and these guys and Lindsey Graham, they were all trying to like pull every ripcord to stop him from doing that. And for him to go out and say, Joe Biden pulled us out from Afghanistan and he's responsible, just one of the most disgusting episodes of hypocrisy playing on the ignorance of so many voters. Uh, so anyway, that's just a, that's another version of the blaming Biden for a thing that Trump tried to do or, or that he precipitated. You're not going to get any, any argument from me on that one. Um, let's go, I want to go back to Tim Scott. Okay. You uh, asserted early on in our conversation that Tim Scott does not believe in um, uh, institutional racism. Are, are you sure? Has he said that he does not? He has said that America is not systemically racist. Um, he, so to what Tim Scott has, I don't think he's thought this through that well, because Tim Scott on the issue, so Tim Scott, for everybody who's not aware, negotiated on police reform with Cory Booker and the Democrats. Tim Scott is very well versed. Tim Scott has personal experience 
of being stopped by police multiple times in situations where a white person would not have been stopped. He knows all about that. He knows all about body cameras, about chokeholds, about um, no-knock warrants. He's very familiar with all that stuff. He does not deny that there are discrepancies sometimes in the way black and white people are treated, but he's very, very attached to this idea of America as a good place. And he doesn't want any language used that implies that America is systemically racist because his message is we are all about what our underlying principles, the stuff that's in the Declaration, the stuff that's in the Constitution, even if it wasn't properly acknowledged in the form of the treatment of, of uh, first slaves and then black Americans. Um, so so that's, that's where I think he is thematically. Do you disagree with this? I, I don't know, um, but... I just wanted you. You made that assertion. I just wanted to, uh, but I, I think generally speaking, that is correct. Like I don't know, I don't know if he would say that. Like if 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 you were to interview him and say, um, do you think that um, African Americans, by virtue of having come through slavery and Jim Crow, might be at a disadvantage, and that there may be. Um, people in in high positions who, you know, over the course, you know, maybe one-on-one, there's a lot of good people on both sides, as Trump might say, but, Mm -hmm. but that institutions, um, like things like redlining, for example, that happened and, and that wealth, uh, the ability to, to accrue wealth that, that a lot of white families had over time, uh, that, that black families did not have that opportunity that, we are still dealing with that. And just because today an African-American who applies for college is maybe treated fairly, maybe given preferential treatment, depending, I guess it's the Supreme Court has said that's out for now. Um, but, but just because today an individual African-American may be treated fairly uh, by an employer or, or what have you, doesn't mean that baked in the cake isn't a disparities that, that go back that's embedded in our country. Like, don't you think if you were to ask him that at some point, he'd be like, yeah, yeah, of course that's true, but we can't have a negative attitude about it. We can't, you can't be, vic- you can't be a victim. You have to overcome. Like, I'd, like I'm wondering if, if, if you were to have a drink with him or something, if, if he would concede that. I, I, first of all, you made a bunch of great distinctions here. Um, I do think, to your point, that Scott's fundamental message, one of the things he's very concerned about is he doesn't want a young black or other minority person to hear messages that tell that person they can't succeed. He wants to maintain like a a can-do spirit. And I, I, I very much sympathize with that. I agree with him on that. But then in the service of that, he doesn't want to say things that might be descriptively true about the situation that would psych that person out. Right. So he doesn't he doesn't like statements about the system being rigged, about, you, you, you know, the, the, it's everything. Everything's too stacked against. By the way, he, Will, he wants... just to put a quick pin on it, the system being rigged. We're making the point of your column. <laughs> Donald Trump goes around all the time talking about the system being rigged against right. Republicans. But back to what you, your premise of your column is, you can't say it's rigged against. A group of folks who've historically had the, the system rigged against them. Right. And like the, the evidence for the system, you know, systematically, it, the evidence for racial disparities in criminal justice is enormous, enormous. I just, in the piece that I just, I just linked to something from the National Academies, they did a study. It's just like, it's, it's very, whereas in the case of Republicans, it's like, if you're a criminal, you get prosecuted. If you're Mike Pence, you're not a criminal, you don't. So the evidence is much better for that. But Tim Scott would never talk to non-white people in America the way he talks to Republicans about how everything's out to get you because he doesn't want to send that. He, he's, he's doing grievance politics for the Republicans. He's against grievance politics for ethnic and racial minorities. Um, the thing you said about being baked in, this is something that a lot of progressives talk about. It's, it's the core of critical race theory. And Tim Scott, I've never heard him talk about it that way. Um, he he will acknowledge bigotry. And Tim Scott was one of the people who stood up when, was it DeSantis who said like, who is it who said there was an upside to slavery? I forget. Um, DeSantis. During the, DeSantis. It, it was part of the Florida educational 
Oh, right. Curriculum or something. Right. And sorry, I don't want to caricature DeSantis because I think some of what was said about it there was, was a character was unfair. But Tim Scott was one of the people. They put a mic in his face and Tim Scott was like, there was nothing redeeming about slavery. You know, and, but his point of view was family. He believes he's a social conservative. He's like this like wrecked families. Like they, they literally sold off your kid or whatever. And that's like, you know, multiple moral violations. So um, he's, he's been clear about, uh, you know, slavery, segregation, discrimination. He's not ambiguous about that. But on this question of what's baked in, of structural differences, <clears throat> I'm just, I don't recall him talking about that. He is, I'm familiar with him talking about policing because he was negotiating with that. But Tim Scott is also very much, he's on the banking committee. He knows a lot of financial stuff. And I honestly don't know. I'll have to look up, Matt, what he has said about redlining. Um. You just triggered an interesting thought or, or, or memory, uh, something I just learned recently. Um, you know, I lived near Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which was the the raid, the John Brown raid. Um, there was a guy named Dangerfield Newby. Have you ever heard of him? No. We need to make this guy more famous. So Django Unchained, the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie, I think is loosely based on him. He, uh, his... His wife was a slave. He was free. He was trying to raise money to buy her freedom. And he got like half of the money or something. And then the slave master sold her to like Mississippi or something. And he like lost touch with her. And because he couldn't, he wasn't able to, to buy her freedom, it, it radicalized him a little. One could imagine that would. So he joined with John Brown, and his goal was, we're going to like, and by the way, it might not have been Mississippi. It could have been North Carolina. I don't know. But um, he was here, you know, in what was at the time Virginia. But he wanted to join with John Brown. The goal was to attack the armory at Harper's Ferry, get weapons. And then he was hoping that they would lead this rebellion, and along the way, they would get his wife back. So amazing story that I had never heard. Until recently. So wow. uh, I'll give you his Hostage name again. Rescue. Danger Field Newbie. Wow. If I, okay. If I ever open a coffee shop or a restaurant, <laughs> or so, there's, there's, there's a, um, in Charlestown, West Virginia, there's a, uh, a brewery called uh, Abolitionist Ale. I would open a Danger Field Newbie uh, coming, <laughs> coming to. Uh, then you'd have to explain who he was to every patron. I will gladly take on that job. I'm going to put, make it, him... put it on the wall. Put the story of Dangerfield yeah. Newbie on the wall, and that's that's the thing. Everyone comes to see it. I think it's you know. Anyway, doing our very small part here on the podcast to uh, to bring some attention to uh, to this historical figure. Uh, Will, I'm going to get you out of here on Nikki Haley. Uh, she had this press conference speech. I'm not sure how you would. Call, I guess it was a speech. Um, in South Carolina, she kind of got the press to show up under the guise that she might be announcing that she was going to withdraw. Instead, she's basically said, I'm in it all the way. Um, we're not getting out. What do you make of, uh, of Nikki Haley's grit, resilience, and does it even matter? It always matters. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was talking about this with Charlie Sykes on the Bulwark podcast. The the you know we the the Bulwark people we all basically came to admire Chris Christie, the twenty twenty four twenty three version of Chris Christie, who renounced you know his role in helping Trump get become president in the first place, regretted a lot of things, but he really went at Donald Trump. And we looked at Nikki Haley and we said, that is a pale version of Christie. That is she's just she wouldn't say what Christie would say, which is that Trump is a bad guy who does bad things, who's betrayed every principle conservatives used to stand for. Haley's version is, you know, Donald Trump, he's very all about himself. And, you know, when he says things like, you know, uh, it, it's the inviting Russia to invade NATO and, uh, you know, it's, and when he insults people like my husband who serve overseas, you know, Haley's version used to be, 
that's just talking about himself and he's not solving our problems. And chaos follows him everywhere he goes. Chaos follows him. The Christie version was, he's chaos causing the it. Problem, right? <laughs> he's the Trump reason, the right? Victim. Chaos right. is chasing So him. she was always doing this weak tea political, <laughs> you know, bank shot version of criticizing Trump. But then Christie gets out of the race because like he's taking votes from Haley in New Hampshire and he's got no path. He doesn't want to be responsible. So they all get out of the race and now Nikki Haley is the alternative. So now there's this moral challenge for Nikki Haley. She's got to be the non-Trump candidate. Can she do that? Is she up to that? Can she say about Trump what, Chris, what Christie said? Does she think it would cost her the nomination? If we're in agreement that she has almost no shot at the nomination, can she at least speak the truth? liberated from that political consideration. And so what I saw in this speech she gave was a, a little bit of that. She's moving somewhat in that direction. She's beginning to say, I mean, Matt, it's not like Donald Trump isn't making it easy for her. When he says this stuff about Navalny and invading NATO and about her husband and like, he's just making it obvious what an awful person he is and how he would betray the United States and the, the free world and everybody. So she did say some of that stuff. She talked about how, what he said about, you know, NATO. And she talked about what he said about her husband and Matt, she got choked up. Did you, you yeah. I, I guess you yeah, said, yeah. I, it was, I, I thought it was a really good moment. Touching. Tell, moment. tell me what you thought. Human. Um, well, do, do you remember, um, uh, Hillary Clinton cry, sort of crying, getting close to crying in New Hampshire? I, I don't remember that. Yeah. In 2008, Obama wins Iowa, and then we're going into New Hampshire. Everybody thinks Obama's going to win New Hampshire. And I think because she was so exhausted, the day, the day before, I think it was the day before the New Hampshire primary, Hillary just like, I don't want to say she cried, but she just had a moment where she just was truthful. Like just all the BS left her, and she just was vulnerable and sympathetic and it just felt a little bit tender for like I don't think Hillary evokes a lot of like love, but it was sweet and and vulnerable, um, and it didn't come it did not come across as weak. It actually really helped her, and and I don't know if that's what boosted her, but that's sort of the mythology is that that was what happened. And this thing with Nikki Haley, um, I don't know how many people were actually going to see it, but to me. Um, it seemed real and authentic and sincere and um, refreshing. So, no, I'm predisposed to kind of like Nikki Haley anyway. So, but to me, like, authenticity is so important in politics. It's very rare. And so I think it was a very good moment for her. Yeah, I, I, I had never seen her break, Matt. I had never seen her break character. And she, it, it, what was fascinating to me is it's at the end and she probably knows she's going to lose it because there's this, she's, she's, she's a very scripted person. The whole thing is scripted, but this is about her husband. And she really is choked up about her husband being away. The kids can't, no, they can't see him. Will he be safe? We got Americans, you know, troops being killed at a base in Jordan, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the Horn of Africa. So the guy is in some danger. And so she's thinking about him and she gets to this and then, you know, she has to take a drink of water and you can see her. She's, she's sort of fighting not to lose it. Then she loses it. And this goes on for like two minutes, three minutes. And then she regains control at the very end. And you see her go back to the script and you hear the traditional, you know, Nikki Haley cadence. And I was very sad. I was just sad because I feel like she's such a scripted person and it would be better for her if she broke character more. Um, nobody, Matt, nobody in this, in this 2024 campaign has stuck more to her script than Nikki Haley. Um, I can, I, 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 if you've watched rallies of hers, you can, you can just repeat all the lines, $30 million for an honors college in Vermont. You know, they, they, I, I know all the lines in the Haley stump speech. And so she broke, she went back, but I would love to see Nikki Haley unplugged, right? She's, she's, she's at the stage of the campaign where she's, she basically held this thing, Matt, to prepare the media for her taking a 20-point shellacking in her home state. That's, that was what this was about, and that she's going to go on. So given that this is all about, you know, what she's going to say on the way to a Trump nomination, why not just speak the truth? And so I, 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 would, 
I'll, I'll plead with Nikki Haley. You don't have to bank shot everything. You know, it's clear from what you said that you believe Donald Trump is empty, is dangerous, that he'll betray everything that you've spent your career fighting for, that other Republicans fought for. Just say it. Just say that it, this is who he is. This is what he would do. There's, it's not a political factor. It's not about him losing to Biden. It's that if he gets elected, he will undermine everything that we do or should believe in. Does she endorse Trump? This is related to the question. Everyone said Nikki Haley was running for vice president. And in this speech, she said, everyone said I was running for vice president. I think I've answered that now, right? She, I don't think she's entirely answered that. The more she, she, the closer she gets to saying that Donald Trump is a bad person and would be bad for America, the, the, you know, the more unpal unpalatable she gets. If you're Trump and you're thinking about how to get a lot of votes, maybe Nikki Haley would be helpful to you. But in terms of endorsement, I've said from the beginning that she would endorse Trump. Christie won't. Haley will. At this point, do I still believe that? God help me, Matt, I do. I believe that she'll endorse Trump. And I think the reason she'll endorse Trump is that she has prepared the groundwork for that by saying all along, we cannot have a President Kamala Harris. We cannot have a President Joe Biden again. The problem with Trump is not just that, not that he's awful, but that he's so awful he'll lose the election and the election will be won by Joe Biden. I just think she'll come back to that in the end and say, we can't have another four years of Biden. We can't have Kamala Harris. So, you know, as much as I hate to say it, we need to stand with the Republican nominee. It'll be a written statement. It won't be a speech, but I think she'll do it. What do you think? I think it's best that we assume that you're right. Her, we've had our hearts broken before, Will. Those of us who, you know, you're, you, you're more of the left, uh, but those of us who are never Trump conservatives have, uh, it's best to like keep our, you know, expectations relatively low. So I'm going to say that you're probably right. Um, but she is coming close to laying the predicate for um, one could make the argument that she has crossed the Rubicon and, and that she has already effectively said that Trump is unfit to be president. Um, so I think if I didn't know, like if I hadn't been burned so many times, and if I hadn't looked naive in the past, I would say once again that I believe in Nikki, but fool me once. What is it George W. Bush said? Fool me once, shame <laughs> on me. Fool me twice, <laughs> don't get fooled again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, once bitten, twice shy, my friend. Right. That, on that, that happy That's a good note, position to take. Yep. <laughs> on that happy note, uh, I said I'm going to get you out of here on Nikki Haley. I'm going to get you out of here on Nikki Haley. But uh, anything, obviously, go read uh, your piece at The Bulwark about Tim Scott. Uh, anything you want to plug? Uh, no, just like, uh, the, you know, very excited for, we have a bunch of new folks at the Bulwark. I hope people will come and look. Um, uh, Tim Miller has taken over the Bulwark podcast from Charlie. Uh, you know, Joe Perticone is writing this great newsletter. We've got Mark Caputo. Uh, we got a whole bunch of new folks, uh, A.B. Stoddard. Um, hope, hope folks will come and take a look at the Bulwark. Awesome. All right. Check out the Bulwark. Will Salatan, thank you for coming back on the news. Thanks, Matt.